Good evening. On behalf of the Acton 250 Committee, welcome to the second in a series of lectures intended to provide a context for the events of April 19th, 1775. May I see the hands of those who were present for the first lecture by Robert Allison. Ah, welcome back. It is available online at Acton 250th events for those of you who were not. Please make a habit of checking the website regularly. We were treated in September to a thoughtful discussion of the events of 1773 leading up to what is now known as the Boston Tea Party on December 16th, 1773. Next month, the Acton Memorial Library will host two programs related to the destruction of the tea. December 10th, a second tour of Acton Center is planned. Watch for registration details at Acton to 50th events. Noted historian Joseph J. Ellis has described the 18th century as a country we need to visit. Recognizing those on the committee with deep knowledge of Acton's history, let me take a moment to introduce Ann Forbes, a well-known architectural historian representing Ironwork Farm in South Acton, a center of local activity in the 1770s. Ann, might you wave at us? There. <laughs> and Bill Clower, the president and spirit of the Acton Historical Society. Please be sure to pick up information on your way out about these resources and visit their websites. To benefit most from this evening's focus on everyday life, let's briefly suspend our knowledge of how the story resolves in 1776 and rely a bit on our imagination. It is my pleasure to welcome Acton's own Mary Fuhrer to help us do so. Mary is a public historian who digs deeply into primary source documents and resources to challenge received wisdom. Her expertise focuses on the social context of the colonial and early republic periods, especially from the vantage point of small towns in our region. Recipient of undergraduate and graduate degrees in history, Dr. Fuhrer is the author of numerous articles and a book focused on a conflict in a Massachusetts town in the first half of the 19th century. Also consultant to Freedom's Way, supporting the revolutionary region, and currently co-author of Mass Moments, accessible at massmoments.org. Let's lean in, suspend what we think we know, and give Mary a hearty welcome to Acton 250. Thanks so much. I appreciate that welcome. Um, I encourage all of you not to look at me. It's all going to be up there. And I'll feel better if you're not looking at me. So we'll do that. I just want to begin, before I begin, by giving you a little challenge. Uh, I'm going to ask if any of you happen, I'll ask at the end, if any of you happen to pick up what is the most important thing making Acton's economy work on the eve of the revolution. And uh, let's see, what's the second? Ah, oh, yeah. What was Simon Hunt's big problem? So we'll get to the end. I'll see if any of you have picked up on that. But that's a fun way for us to begin, I think. All right, thank you for coming to be time travelers with me. I really appreciate that you're introducing this as um, a, another time, another world. Um, there is a great quote that says, let me just move you forward here. 
Uh, there's a great quote from a novel, a 1953 novel, that says the past is a foreign country. And that is really an excellent metaphor. Um, life in Acton 250 years ago would seem totally foreign to us. We think we know about it because we live here now, and they were people, and we are people. But in fact, it was a totally different world. Um, here you have a print by Amos Doolittle of Lexington Common on the morning of April 19th. You see the men in grayish blue there running away, um, and the unseen women waiting for them. They lived in a different world. They lived in a world of family farms and close bonds and mutual dependence on neighbors and a really tight social order that was based on local belonging, and we don't know that world. We are going to take a tour of it now, and we're going to enter like a tourist, expect it to seem different and alien as we get to know it, and why do we need to do this? So that we have a better, maybe a better grounded sense of why they did what they did, rather than our 21st century interpretation of why they did what they did on April 19th. I do want to begin, though, with an acknowledgment. Um, obviously, those men in gray were not the first people to settle, to live in Acton. Uh, first European settlers came to Acton around the 1650s, but the Nipmuc had been using this as their native lands and stewarding and shepherding this landscape for generations before European settlers set down their roots. They inhabited a different world as well, but that's a tour, another tour for another day. Today, we're taking the late colonial Acton tour. So what will we see on our tour of Acton, late colonial Acton? We'll see, we'll learn about the structures of families, about homes and household possessions, about farms and how farming shaped daily life, about the essential role of neighbors, the role of the church, of town and belonging. And we're going to take two tour guides with us. <laughs> this, I submitted this slide deck before I made a correction. So the two tour guides are Simon Hunt and Hannah Davis. I don't know where Lucy Davis came from. She just popped out of somewhere when I was typing. But it's Hannah Davis, who is the wife of Isaac Davis. They're going to be our tour guides on this tour. So let's start. There we go. Let's start with uh, families and households. Families had deep roots. I like this metaphor as trees. Families had deep roots and broad branches. And by deep roots, I mean that by the eve of the revolution, three to four generations of a family had lived in Acton over 100 years. I don't think there's anyone today who could say that their family has lived in, maybe I'm wrong. Bill, has anyone lived in Acton? Any family been in Acton for over 100 years? No, my, my wife's the eighth generation. There we go, we have one. Two, well, two, wonderful, wonderful. So you would share some of their sense of these deep roots for families that had been here for generations. And that creates a kind of proprietary sense, a sense of ownership. I mean, basically, you know everyone's stories. And you have this deep sense of place, uh, a shared history with everyone. Of course, that nature of sharing history is linked to the twin senses of owning the town and belonging to the town. They are also, oops, no. Jump the gun. There were also broad branches. Um, when neighbors marry neighbors, kin becomes kin. Neighbors, when kin marries neighbors, neighbors become kin. There we go. And this creates a kind of a broad cousinhood. You know you're related to pretty much everyone in town at some level, one way or another. And that reinforces the sense of belonging, except for those who are not part of this belonging. And we do have to remember, as I will talk extensively about belonging, that there were people in town who did not belong. Some of them might be newcomers. Some of them might be nonconformers. Maybe you wore a beard, and beards were simply a no-no at some points. Um, maybe you didn't wear a beard when beards were requisite. 
Um, if you were a, a not a conformer, if you were not a belonger, that challenged your sense of, of being part of the town. Maybe you were othered in some other way. Maybe you were a person of color. Maybe you came from a foreign country, very few of them, but there were a few mingling in and out. Maybe you were Native American. If you were a non-Native three to four generation act and resident at this point, then there was that issue of non-belonging. But for the rest, there was a strong kin-based tight communal order. And I want to give, as my first tour guide example here, Captain Simon Hunt and his family. This is not his family, but this is um, just about the size of his family. This is the Savage family from Worcester, I believe. And um, here you can see the deep roots. The Hunts were a very old Concord family. They'd been early settlers in Concord. Um, Simon Hunt's father had helped to build the first church. You can find him in the church record books, um, contributing labor and lumber. His father had served in just about every town office that there was. And Simon was captain of the West Militia Company on April 19th. He was in his mid-40s. He was a well-established farmer with a South Acton farm on um, what we call Liberty Street now. Uh, Liberty, we call it Liberty Street because it was at, at one point, I, don't, I would get, doubt that the elm tree is still there, but at one point it was the site of the Liberty elm tree. Is the elm tree gone? I would guess with Dutch elm disease it is. So he was deeply a part of a deep, deep roots in town. And broad branches, look at all these children. He had 11 children, not that unusual. The average family had eight surviving children in a household. And then consider also that you're adding to that that he had siblings, and his siblings lived around, and they also had an average of eight children. And you end up with a huge Hunt clan, interrelated clan all over the place. So you have these nuclear families whose point is nurture, but they're also a working unit. You're, they essentially bred the labor they needed to run their farm. Oh, come on, you can do it. There we go. So I want to introduce at this point this idea with families of family government. In a well-ordered society, nobody lived alone. It was considered morally wrong, in fact, for anyone to live alone, because then they weren't under the watchful eye of a patriarch, of a father figure somewhere who knew the right way for them to behave. In fact, what do you call an old woman who lives alone? Any guesses? Hmm? So, an old lady who lived alone was a witch. Because she shouldn't be living alone. And if she weren't doing things she ought not to be, she wouldn't be living alone. She would have incorporated herself into somebody's family. So there's a strong sense of family government. Everyone's expected to live in the households under the government of a patriarch. Now, the patriarch had a responsibility. He had to support all of them from his farm. And he had to discipline them all. And he had to take care of them all. But in return, they all had to work for him. They had to obey him. They had to submit to his governance and his discipline. Um, they used to call families at this time and before this, a family is a little commonwealth because it was properly governed, disciplined by the patriarch. So because everyone should be living in families, then we have all single people in families, widows, orphans, adult children who, didn't, who weren't married yet, um, anyone like this. Family had a different definition. We're more likely to call it households now. And it was extensive, and it was elastic. So who might be in a family? You would have, obviously, the husband and wife. You would have children. Remember, we said six to eight per family. You'd have grandparents if they didn't have their own home still. Any unmarried siblings of the husband and wife. Visiting relatives, and relatives did frequently come to visit. If you need a little extra labor at a, at a certain period of time, the relatives might come for six months or more. Um, apprentices, if you like, uh, Isaac Davis was a gunsmith. If he had an apprentice, they would, that person would come and live in the family. He would live in the house, he would eat, he would sleep, he would be raised, and he would, the master of the house would be his master. Um, 
Hired help, and that was very common. We might need some hired help to get in your hay crop. Um, so you might hire two months hired help, or you might have even a season of hired help. They'd all come and live in the family with you and be part of the family. Boarders, remember, you're not supposed to be living alone. So if you're a single person, um, you might board with someone else. The town poor, which we'll talk about later, but the town poor were taken care of by being sent out to live in individual families. And slaves, all of these were part of the family. And it would not be uncommon, I've come across um, diary references to women saying things like, my family currently has 15. It's, it's a large group, and it's a large group that creates intimate bonds by living together for a long time. And if you doubt that, you should check the number of hired help who end up marrying the daughters of the farmer in the family, or vice versa, domestics who end up marrying the son in the family. Um, not surprising, you live together for six months, nine months, a year. So you have these intimate relationships within them. Now, what's their house and home like? What is that like? The first thing I want you to realize, they were small. Most of the houses that we see that are we call colonial houses are what are left over because they're mansions. The really the most common houses, the smallest houses, either didn't survive or they got added to until they became mansions. But if you look at the second uh, image there, you see the most common hall, and I'm a little, boy, I feel a little funny talking about this in front of Ann Forbes, who could give you this lecture. But the second image there is the, the old English parlor, hall and parlor design, a two-room house. And if you added two rooms above it, you had your standard two over two house, a four-room house. Remember, we're talking about 15 or more people, probably. But here's your four-room house. Then go down to the second image from the bottom. And that is the hall and parlor design to which a shed roof has been added on the back, and they'd put in a kitchen. And you see this all over the place. There's a uh, side view off to the side there. You can see the shed roof coming down. So there's a hall, the parlor, and the kitchen in the back with maybe a buttery or a little storage room um, next to it. Um, James Fletcher wrote originally of Hannah Davis, Hannah and um, Isaac Davis's house. The original house was two story in front and the back sloped down to one, the kitchen in the lower part. So this is a five-room house. This is the salt box house that Hannah Davis and Isaac Davis lived in. This is the size of it. All right, what about household goods? Um, how would we know? How would we know what they had in their houses 250 years ago? Well, we got really lucky because they died. And their death, especially if they had heirs to distribute their property to, meant that we got a record of what they owned when they died. And what happened is that they would call in a couple of neighbors, the neighbors would walk room by room, and would write down absolutely every last thing that person owned because everything had a value. And they'd put the value to it, then they'd use it to split up the property evenly among the heirs. But in the meantime, we get a list, sometimes room by room, of everything they owned, which allows us to reconstruct what was where and how they used it. And we get a wonderful picture of their life. So let's look, since we do have, actually, the inventory of Isaac Davis, who, of course, did die um, April 19th. Uh, by June, his neighbors had taken an inventory. We have that record. Um, we can read it and try to reconstruct what ha his house was like and his furnishings were like on the eve of the revolution. So let's consider first the parlor space. And the parlor, remember I said there's a hall and a parlor. The parlor was the public space. Strange idea to us, but the parlor was where you put everything you were proud of, your best possessions, which included your best bed. That master and mistress slept in the parlor in their best bed. And by the way, the most expensive part of the bed was not the bedstead, was not the bedding or the bed curtains. Anybody want to guess the most expensive part of the bed? The mattress with the feathers in it was by far the most expensive thing. 
probably don't. But they wanted everyone to see. If you had a really thick mattress, a really fluffy feather bed, you wanted it right there in the public room for everyone to see how fancy it was. And this is what we see in the, um, the parlor of their house. We see their best bed, also a desk, table, chairs, a looking glass, which is a mirror, of course, and there's a trunk mentioned. I'm not positive which room it's in, but it probably has their best clothes and linens, as well as andirons for the fireplace, a warming pan for the bed, and a window curtain. There's a little bit of clothing mentioned and a pair of brass, no, silver shoe buckles. That's their one luxury item besides the looking glass, which is pretty nice, silver shoe glass. But it's, it's pretty restrained when you consider what we own. What about the other rooms? Well, all the other rooms in the house are going to be multi-use. Across from the parlor was the hall. The hall is a workspace. It's a utilitary work and gathering space. So it would be used for things like fiber production and sewing and knitting and mending and also for gathering the family at night. Um, was just talking with someone who was reminding me before that when night fell, it became dark and lighting was expensive and not very available. People who needed to do things tended to gather together in one room and that's what they might use the um, hall for, to gather together for reading, for sh school lessons, for things like that. So in their hall, they had um, a chairs, a great wheel, which is a wool wheel or a walking wheel, a little wheel, which is a linen wheel, a flax wheel, um, a, a Bible, spectacles, and this may be the room where Isaac Davis kept his gun and pistol and cartridge box as well. We can't be sure. And then in the back, remember I said the back room was the kitchen? The kitchen is the center of this manufactory. The farmhouse needs to be thought of, not just as a residence, but as a manufactory. This is where, the farm is where the men took the raw materials of life and the women turned those raw materials into what they needed to survive on. And they did that frequently in this kitchen space. So they might have in the space um, tools for preserving and drying food, uh, pickling, salting, doing laundry, cooking, baking, making soap and candles, uh, things like that. And sure enough, the tools from the itinerary say that they have a work table and chairs, a case of knives, pewter and earthenware dishes, iron and brass pots and kettles, a churn, bread trough, fireplace crane and tool, pickling tubs, meat salting tubs, and wash tubs. Notice almost everything in this kitchen is utilitarian. This is for working. This is for making life work on a farm. So that's the farmhouse. Now you have to humor me for a little bit. We're gonna stop at the farm. We're gonna spend a little bit of time at the farm. We'll move faster after we get past the farm. I'm gonna spend, partly I'm gonna spend more time on the farm because it's really important for understanding their daily life, but partly I'm spending more time on the farm because I'm a nerd and I love it. So, farming. We need to understand farming because this is a critical part of what shaped their mindset, what shaped their mentality at the time, what shaped the patterns and rhythms of their daily life, the meanings that they attach to daily life. This is the core of what they lived to be. So you know the, po the poem, Here Once the Embattled Farmers Stood. They were all farmers. Even if you were a minister, a doctor, a blacksmith, any of those specialized things, you were primarily a farmer. And that meant that you and all the men around you sh shared the same identity. Um, you all desired to say, I own my own land, I have my own farm. Now why is that important? Here's where you have to indulge my nerdishness. A Yankee yeoman farm was the source of your independent identity as a man. If you owned enough land, you could support your family, you could produce most of what your family needs, so you are not dependent on any other man. 
If you owned enough land, you had the right to participate in town government. The amount of land that you owned is going to determine your status in the community. It's going to determine the prospects of your children. And every family's goal is to acquire, acquire enough land for a sustainable farm for themselves and eventually to have enough land to set up every one of your sons in a, a sustainable farm. So what did you need for your farm? In colonial New England, a farm that would sustainably produce food, clothing, and fuel for an average family required 60 acres. And why do I say sustainably? You know, you can farm all sorts of ways, and one way you can farm is to run your land into the ground quickly, and that won't work for them. They're trying to provide for their sons. So, it's not just any 60 acres. It's a particular assortment of types of land, and a, there is not a farm anywhere in New England that ever looked just like this, a nice rectangle with six boxes, all five boxes, six, all lined up next like that. These pieces of land probably weren't even all contiguous. They were probably spread over land where the land was best suited for its use. But 60 acres of the right type of land is what they needed. Why do they need these types of land? Well, let's first say, just go over quickly what they are. There's a house lot, two acres, orchard, two acres, tillage, six acres, pasture, 15, meadow, 15, and woodlot, 20. And if you had all of this, you had a farm. Not fields, not land, but a farm. They also called it a messuage, old French, English word. But it was a farm. If you did not have this assortment of types of land, you didn't own a farm, you just owned some land. And you could hope to own a farm someday. All right, let's take a second and go through those types of land. Uh, the house lot. The house lot is where you shelter yourselves in your house and your animals in the barn. And there's a dooryard area and a barnyard area that you're gonna use intensively for turning raw materials into the, the uh, products that you need to survive on. There's also gonna be a dooryard garden where you're gonna grow all your vegetables, which by the way, they did not call farming. That was called gardening and women did it. Men did farming. Just, we'll come to that distinction in a second. So all of that together, you'd need about two acres. And then you needed orchard. Um, of course you wanted fruit, but far more importantly, you didn't trust the water worth beans around where you were and you aren't gonna drink it. What you were gonna drink was hard cider that you made from your apples. And you needed about two 32 gallon barrels of apple cider per person in a farm. And that adds up for the average family to about two acres of orchard. And then you need, oh, were we here? I hope we were here when we talked about fruit, because it would have been a little confusing if we were here. And then you needed the six acre of tillage. Tillage is land that's tilled or broken or plowed, and it's land that's used for growing grains, the grains that you're gonna turn into your bread, and a little bit for growing flax that you'll turn into linen cloth. This is really critical because this is the land that feeds you. This is your bread crop land, you need this. So you need about six acres to feed your average family. And there's a problem with this. If you just grow it and you don't fertilize it, you only grow for a little bit of time. So here's a little factoid that you're all gonna take home to Thanksgiving dinner because everybody wants to talk about this. To keep that land fertile, for each acre, you need the manure of one cow. So you need the manure of six cows to keep your tillage land fertile. And those cows naturally, nicely, will also give you milk and beef, but most importantly, they're giving you manure. But the cows need to eat if they're gonna give you the manure that's gonna keep your tillage fertile so that you can eat grains. And the cows, six cows need to eat, um, require about 15 acres of pasture to eat. Except, of course, in New England, you can't graze in the wintertime. So then you need to feed your animals in the barn on hay, and you get your hay from a meadow. That's a place where you mow things. So a meadow is not the same as a pasture, and neither one of them is, is well, they're both fields, 
but field does not adequately describe either one of them. By the way, you don't have to remember any of this. You just, we'll just, it's just the main part about why farms were important. Um, so the meadow, to get enough hay to feed through the winter to feed six cows, you need another 15 acres of meadow. And here's the key thing about the meadow. It's, it's what everything turns on. Because the early meadows, the best meadows, were down by rivers and lakes. Uh, not lakes, rivers and streams. And, in the, and they, they still are, as a matter of fact. And they would drain them off in the spring and harvest the meadow over the summer, mow, mow the meadow. And then come the next winter and spring, they would flood, which is what happens in the spring. And the flood would bring nutrients to the hay. So the flood would feed the hay, and the hay and the pasture would feed the cows, and the cows would feed the tillage, and the tillage feeds you, and everybody stays happy, if you have a whole farm. Oh, one last thing that you need. I, I, don't even try to remember this. I'll say it really fast. You need fuel, and you need 20 acres. Why? Because it takes about an acre of woodlot cleared to produce the 20 to 30 cords of wood that you need to heat your house, and it takes 20 years for it to regrow. So if you're taking a 20th, you need 20 acres to have it ready to grow again, harvest again in 20 years. And you can forget I said that, just say 20 acres of woodlot. OK. They knew this. They knew this calculus. It was woven into them. Every single one of them knew what they needed if they were going to have a farm that was really going to sustain the family and keep them independent. And you can tell that they knew this. If you look at the bottom, this is a valuation, a valuation about every seven years. The town would require, not the town, actually, the province would require that every town would report exactly how much land and what type of land everybody owed, owned. And so we have this record, and it's there for Acton. It's not only there for Acton, but about 40 years ago, some very nerdy people entered it all into a database, and it's printed out in a book. And you can just go next door to the library, ask for the 1771 valuation, open the page, look up your person, and see how much land they owned. Just, just don't behave. You know. um, but anyway, the valuation. Look at the headings of the valuation on the bottom there. Uh, forget polls, and uh, there's polls rateable and polls non rateable. That's just a poll tax on people. And then there's housing, mills, but then. Orchard, mowing, pasture, tillage. So they knew, and now we can know, exactly what mattered to them in these farms. Um, you don't have to pay. Whoops, that didn't take it. Let's go this way. You don't have to absorb this whole slide. Just look at the top left part. This is Simon Hunt. He's our captain. He's one of our tour guides. That's his 1771 valuation. He's got acres of house and orchard. He's got seven acres of tillage, more than he needs. 10 acres of pasture, but there's a note on it. If this will feed 15 cows, it must have been very good pasture. 21 acres of meadow, more than he needs, and 42 acres of woodlot. He's doing really well. He's in a good place, 84 acres of land. Um, and in fact, he may well be a captain because he's doing really well. They put a lot of store by the, your landed wealth. So, all right, that's, that's the farm. We're going to move quickly through these last two sections so that we can sum up this general sense. The neighborhood. I'll go back to the neighborhood for a second. Neighborhood. Even though we just talked about people really wanting to have their independent farm, there is no such thing. No man is an island, neither is any household, and not a single farm in Acton was completely independent. They all needed their neighbors. This is so critical for us to remember. They need their neighbors for socially, for visiting and sharing and birthing babies and nursing sick people and burying the dead. I mean, a common phrase in the primary sources is, is they called in the neighbors, which could be a happy thing or a very sad thing, but you call in the neighbors. The best praise in an obituary or just in comment about someone, she was a good neighbor. You don't even need to say anything more. She was a good neighbor. Um, all of this, people, 
participated in without any sort of monetary compensation. It was considered um, a deposit that you made into the bank of goodwill because you never knew when you might need to make a withdrawal. And this really bound people together. You also needed your neighbor to make the economy work. No farm can be totally self-sufficient. Um, Simon Hunt was lucky, but a lot of people had came close, but they were a little short on, say, meadow, and they were going to run out a little short on hay. Or maybe they had extra um, um, orchard land, but they were a little short on something else. What are they going to do about this? Well, they enter, I keep using the wrong thing, there we go. They enter the account book world. Um, I know that sounds incredibly boring, and it's so fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating what falls out of account books. So what, what happens? Well, imagine this. There are no stores in town. There just weren't. For, until the early 19th century, it was very rare for villages to have any sort of general store. Even if there had been a store in town, there's no cash. This is one of the big complaints that um, colonists have. There is no species, there's no cash around to be had for people. So what are you gonna do? No stores, no cash. They used account books. How did it work? Every farmer kept a book, an account book, with a page for all of his neighbors. And he kept track of everything that he provided his neighbors on credit. So if you run low on flour or on hay or, or labor to get your, your crop in, um, if you need to borrow a tool or you don't have a draft animal, a lot of men didn't have oxen. They had to borrow oxen when they needed it. You needed any of these things. Maybe you need an expertise of a craftsperson, such as a blacksmith or, some, or a tanner, and you can't do that. You go to the neighbor that you want to do it to. He takes out his book. He gives you what you want. He marks down the value of what he gave you in his account book, and then everybody goes home. And then the next thing you know, he needs something. And he comes to you. He needs a hundred weight of hay. And you just open to his page and you write down a hundred weight of hay and the amount he owes you. And what happens eventually, maybe once a year, maybe more, maybe less, the two men get together. It's pretty, usually sort of a social occasion. And they compare their two books. And they draw a line and they say, in this case, if you look February 20th, 1946, that this is John Parker from Lexington, his account book, and he was a woodworker. So then reckoned with Ensign Pierce, who is his closest neighbor, and there is due to me three pounds, two shillings, three pence. Writes that down, on they go. No cash exchanges hands. In fact, they may settle at death, or they may just hand the account book to the heir, and on he goes. I just want you to think about this for a second. It works really well to make the economy work, but it also creates this amazing web of mutual dependence. Think if you were in debt to all your neighbors, and they were in debt to you. This is not just how does it feel. This is real stuff. This is your and think. You can only do this comfortably if you trust your neighbor and if you trust that your neighbor's going to stay there, that he's not going to be gone in a month or a year. And then your experience is he's been here for 100 years. Why should his family leave now? Well, I won't ask that because they did have reasons to leave now. But nevertheless, this account book world wove people together and along with that cousinhood that we talked about before and the intimate experience of living in each other's homes, this bound people in this wonderfully tight, well, maybe not wonderful, depends upon your nature, bound people together in this tight web of relationship. So we're coming down to the end now, the church. Uh, let me go back for a second just to introduce this. I don't know if most of you are familiar with this concept. It, it is a shock to people who aren't familiar with it. But the Puritan church in New England was a covenant church. Does anyone know what that means? Yes? Yes. It's, it's a covenant agreement between God and the whole church. 
And actually, even up to your salvation comes as a group, as the whole church. Not in, and we won't get into theology. We'd never get home. But this is, this is a critical thing. It's a corporate, by that I mean bodily sensitivity. They thought of the church as a body. You're one body. And if you injure your finger, it's going to hurt your whole body. So everybody in that church had responsibility for everyone else's well-being and also for everyone else's behavior because you're all getting, getting or not getting together. Um, this is the first meeting house. And I just wanted to uh, point out a couple of things from your church records, which I will comment your minister at this period has the most awful handwriting I have ever come across of any historic person I have ever had to research. It's absolutely unbelievable, but he did keep records. And in, at one point, for example, um, in discussing church discipline, he says, uh, he records William Cone, oh, no, let's do the other one first. He records the long absence of our brother Mark White Jr. from worship. What shall we do? And they all discuss this, and they decide they will appoint a committee to go and visit him to determine why he has not been at worship and to make sure that he returns. Or another time, it says, William, Mr. William Conant and his wife confessed fornication and were admitted. And his wife confessed fornication? Yes, what they're doing is they just got married, which is usually when you join the church, and apparently it was evident that they had had sexual relations before they were married because they produced a baby not long after they were married. And so they have to confess to the sin of fornication, which is sex before marriage, in front of the whole church and be forgiven by the whole church before they're allowed to join the church. This is the sort of intimate degree to which they would be involved in your lives in this church matter. Um, this is a seating house, a meeting house seating plan. This is not Acton's meeting house seating plan. Acton voted to seat the meeting house in 1770, and I cannot find a record of it anywhere. Oh, it breaks my heart. But you couldn't just walk into the church and sit down wherever you wanted. Um, a seats were assigned by age and dignity. And dignity meant how much wealth you had. So this, the committee to seat the meeting house determines who's the wealthiest, who has the most dignity, added to age, and distributes the pews of the meeting house accordingly. And this obviously is not egalitarian, not in any sense. And we shouldn't imagine that this was an egalitarian time. Despite the rhetoric that may come out of it, there's still strong hierarchy as you know from the patriarchy that I was talking about earlier. So you seat the meeting house. You can tell the social status of everyone in that meeting house from their distant, by their distance to the pulpit. And people of color were not allowed to sit on the main floor. They had to sit in the gallery above. So although there will be much talk about equality, it's aspirational. We had a ways to go. OK, finally, the town. Well, just like you couldn't waltz into the church, you couldn't waltz into the town. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but you had to belong to the town to live here. Does anyone know what I mean by belonging to the town? And that, by the way, is the language that they used. They wouldn't say, where is he from? They'd say, where does he belong? So belonging is a type of legal settlement. And you got belonging by being born in a town, or by marrying someone who was born in the town, or by moving to the town and paying taxes in the town for 10 years without being warned out. And warning out is when the selectmen say, hey, did you see so-and-so just moved into the house on such and such a street? We better go over there and, and warn him out. And they go over and they literally say, you are warned out to depart within 15 days. You don't have to depart within 15 days, really. But what they're saying is, if you become poor and need help, you have nothing from us because we warned you and you don't belong here. I 
I, I, I find this so fascinating, and I won't go on about it because it's, it, it's time for me to finish up, but I do want you to think about this idea that you have to belong to the town. They will take care of you. They have to take care of you by law if you belong, but they control whether or not you belong. It just, I just want you to hold that. All right, and what did the town do for business? Um, it's, first thing you may not be familiar with, perambulate the town lines. Has anybody heard this term, perambulate? You actually had a group of men go out once a year and walk the town borders and make sure that the, the little markers that say, this is where our town ends, has a, the year painted on it or whatever you want to say. So you can stake out, yep, this is our town. Other than that, it's all things you'd be familiar with now. So they allocate support for um, overseeing the maintenance of roads and bridges and things like that public works, the pound. Um, am I on the right slide? Let's see. Yep, I can go forward to this. Uh, town matters, town roads. Um, they also um, th maintain the schoolhouses and hire the schoolmasters. And this is the big one, the one that I was talking about before, care of the town poor. If you become poor, if you live in town, if you belong to town and you become poor, the town has to take care of you. And you know how they do it? bring you to town meeting, and they auction you off to the lowest bidder. So they say, who will take John Doe? And John Doe is a younger man. He's got a lot of good labor left in him. And people are pay bidding a paramount to take John Doe. They'll take him because they can get some work out of him. And who will take Widow Trow? Oh, no, nobody wants Widow Trow. She's a pain in the neck and she can't do anything. So that's a very low amount. But they auction poor people, dependent people, off to the lowest bidder. Then that person goes and lives in that house under the household government of that family and is taken care of that way. If the person does not belong to town. Oh, there's a, a quote down here. Remember we talked about Widow Trow being at um, Simon Hunt's house? Here, Widow Trow is being auctioned off for 13 weeks. She was struck off to Calvin Haywood for five shilling, nine pence. But then William Conant, he actually dis was poor and didn't belong to Acton. And they put him in a cart and carried him out of town. And in the next case, they carried him to the Westford town line, said, yeah, this is where you belong, dumped him there, and came back and paid the man who took him in this cart for the line. This is, this is what belonging and not belonging can result in, the importance of belonging. So finally, let's just come back over all of these ideas. We keep talking about belonging, mutual dependence, um, uh, need, shared need, bonds. And yet, when we come to the end of this tour with Isaac Davis here heading to the North Bridge, we have this iconic image of the embattled farmer. And he's fighting for what? We'd say he's fighting for life, for personal liberty, for the individual pursuit of happiness. They did not think this way. That was not their mentality. Individual, individualism is a much more modern story. The people of Colonial Acton lived in a traditional world of belonging, of mutual dependence on your kin and your neighbor and your church and your town. Um, they were taught to privilege common good and common wealth over personal distinction. I don't want you to romanticize any of that. It's not romantic. It's not that long after that that we have Henry David Thoreau telling people to march to the beat of their, the music they hear of their different drum, or Emerson saying what we need is self-reliance. So there's, an, there's a, a flip side to this. But what we do have to acknowledge is that these were the dominant values of that time. On the eve of the revolution, this was the different foreign country that the people of Acton lived in. So, so let, me just, let me just 
ask quickly, does anybody know now what was Simon Hunt, what was his big problem? He did. He had 84 acres, but how many sons did he have? Did anyone notice? He's got a lot of kids, and he does not have the land for those sons. And that's going to be a huge issue in the 20 years after the revolution. When you start seeing people from Acton heading off to Vermont, to Eastern Vermont, New York, all over the place, because they've run out of land. And what was the most important thing to make their economy run that you'll talk about at Thanksgiving dinner? Horse manure. Yes, that horse manure there. Who knew? Hi, hi, Mary. If you want to call on anybody, just let me know and sure. I'll get this to them. And also, can I say for the people on Zoom, if they raise their hand on, on Zoom, uh, Matt Murphy will, will get a hold of you and get you in line. Great. So go ahead, Mary. Who's next? Anyone? We, there's got to be some brave students out there. Yes. Oh. So the question is, were there poor houses back then? Cities, a few cities like Boston had a poor house, but the actual growth of poor houses in the countryside came around um, the 1820s. They tried it. They tried a few times um, experimenting on it. Do you know what a poor house is or the poor farm? It's instead of putting people up for auction, you send the poor in your town to one farm where they work the farm and whatever they grow on the farm is what supports them. And being sent to the poor farm was nobody's idea of heaven. But it does become very popular in the 1820s and 1830s for one reason only, and that is it saved a lot of money. Yes? Mary, um, so in the case where Isaac Davis was killed, his wife couldn't own property. What happened to his property? Well, his wife could own a third of his property as long as she was alive. And frequently, if it, there was a will with it, it would say as long as she was alive and not married. But it was called the widow's third. So she could live on a third of his property. The other two thirds, of course, would go to his children. And they were young at this time. So she could have. If it's my understanding, I think Bill told me that she married two more times after that. Um, she apparently had no issue with property in the end. <laughs> she acquired, but yes, she would. Uh, widows were provided for in that way that they kept control of a third of the property. Here, we're going to go down this row. I might have missed this, but the town pound, what is that? Yeah, the pound. Um, so the... the <laughs> The first town office that you were likely to hold was that of Hogreave. It was always given to the man most recently married. And the Hogreave's job was to go around and round up any hogs that were getting into other people's vegetable gardens or um, tillage land. And once you rounded up the hog, you, it was impounded, it was put in the town pound, the way some people do for dogs now. Other animals could end up in the pound as well. but. They were usually, well, sheep, I guess. Um, larger animals would be claimed very quickly. <laughs> Hi. Um, if there was no currency, uh, how did they put a valuation on the things that they were entering into their account books? Mm -hmm. You said, you know, mm -hmm. so many pounds, so many shillings. So they were absolutely brilliant in, in memory, too, in knowing exactly what everything was worth. They knew the value. If there had been money, they knew how much money you'd have to pay for it. And that's a different thing from actually having the money. So they made that work by putting down, let's say you, um, uh, John Parker as a, a wheelwright in the 1760s, late 1760s when women were spinning again, having spinning parties, a lot of them needed wheels. So he would make these spinning wheels he knew the value of a spinning wheel, and he could charge that to their account. Does that make sense? Not really, because these things were shifted over time. Um, they shift over time only if there's a really active market that's allowing, um, there's you know, increase in demand, decrease in supply, um, that's allowing these things to change. But also, 
they had a very strong sense that the economy was not just about market forces, that it was about the moral value of something. So if they had known for 30 years that the moral value of a spinning wheel was a certain amount, they weren't going to charge more than that unless the currency had been devalued or escalated. I mean, they, they made adap adaptions for changes in currency, but they weren't as likely to. I'm, I'm looking out my side eye at my economist husband saying, right, right? <laughs> but actually, that it, 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 it was, they were much less likely to follow market fluctuations. In fact, if, if um, a miller charged more than the customary amount for his grain because there was a shortage of it, he might be, um, well, what were some of the things they did? Ridden on a rail, that was one way they would discourage him. Um, there were all sorts of um, sort of moral ways of humiliating, embarrassing, and punishing anyone who transgressed what was considered a moral um, version of the economy or prices. Yeah, um, I have a, a, a series. Is this on? Can't tell. Yeah. yeah, a series of questions about schools. You know, when were they founded? How were they funded? Mm -hmm. Who got to go to them? Mm -hmm. How they got teachers? You know, any, anything you have in that, in that vein. Right, and actually the Acton Historical Society has done a lot of research, which is a good thing to, to um, point you towards because every town was different. In general, there would be a center schoolhouse and then district schools wherever there were, you know, maybe the north and the south, maybe the four corners, maybe there's a mill village, wherever there's a concentration of people. And they frequently funded them on a rotating basis. So they might have a six-week session at one school and then six weeks at another. Um, Isaac, excuse me, Simon Hunt was a school teacher, and part of his pay was being paid by the town because there'd be a committee in the town that would appoint schoolmasters and um, pay them after they served their term. This is for boys. For girls, it depends very much on the town, but in many towns, girls um, were limited to attending dame schools where they learn the basics of reading, um, they may learn some writing, and then they learned skills they'd need at home. Um, but you should look, Bill can tell you, I think I came across a number of research projects from Acton on Acton schools, Is that, isn't that right? All right, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot there, take it. I need to visit and find out too. But. And they, the conditions in schools could be horrible, unbelievably horrible, what passed for, for um, education. But they did learn to read and write. And uh, maybe we could ask Matt Murphy. Do, Matt, do you have anything out there in Zoom land? Any questions coming your way? I think he can. There are no hands right now. OK. Well, we have, we have one over here. Um, I'm wondering how they manage a common natural resource like a river or a stream so somebody wouldn't divert it for their own purposes and take it away from the rest of the community. Wow, that's a huge question. It's a great question because it has a lot to do with this, the idea of the commons. Um, there are some resources that serve everybody. And a perfect example is uh, there may be a river where everybody's accustomed to fishing. And then... Um, somebody decides to build a mill for whatever purpose you want for mill. There's so many purposes for mills. Let's say they wanted to build a, 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 lim, a sawmill. At certain times of the year, when they are running their mill, they're interrupting the flow of the water. So how do they work that out? It, with a lot of debate and discussion, and most men who owned mills up to the beginning of the 19th century were very careful about operating them seasonally when the fish were not running. They were, it was this a sense that it was a right given with conditions, and they were very careful. What happens in the um, early 19th century is we start to build power mills and owned by corporations, and they don't play by the same rules, and everything changes. Yeah. Um. Was it possible for people who are belonged to like become un like unbelonged? I guess you could say. Also, like what about like with crimes and 
So that's a good question. So crime did not strip you of your belonging in town, your legal settlement. Um, in fact, there was probably no moral thing that you could do that would strip you of legal settlement. But it is possible to lose your settlement if you leave town. And this became a big issue as more people started moving around when they needed more land. So they might try saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try settling a plot in New Hampshire. And they'd go up there, they'd start, and then they'd run into trouble and they'd come back. And the town would say, you don't belong here anymore. You lost your belonging when you came. So in that way, you could lose. And I may be wrong, but I've never come across a case where a town has ever stripped someone. Oh, there is a case, actually. It's post this time. But there's a case where a man was an ardent Tory. And he is considered, because of his Tory views, He's, he becomes, the town declares him an alien, not just not belongs to the town, but he is an alien. He does not become a US citizen, he does not have any of the rights, and he also loses town belonging. But in the colonial period, I, um, the, the main reason you'd lose belonging is, well, the other reason is if you're a woman and you marry someone from another town, you lose your primary belonging of your first town of birth, and you take on the belonging of the town you go to. Good question. Like Were there any taverns or public like meeting places in Acton? <laughs> yeah, there were a lot, weren't there? Um, Bill, you know better than I. But they're, 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 yes, go ahead. It, this is, and taverns were, were marvelous because they were yet one more place where community came together to exchange ideas. But who are our tavern? Why were people auctioned to the lowest bidder, and not like the highest bidder, like the poor people? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you, I will answer that question, but um, I thought you were going to ask answer about taverns. <laughs> um, there were taverns in town. Um, there are still there's the um, the iron. Yes, the iron. Go go ahead. Someone who knows about the taverns in town because they've been really well researched. Jones Tavern and Bill. I know there were many others. Maybe that's why he absented himself yeah. from church. <laughs> Taverns played a wonderful role. Let me go back to your question about auctioning. They auctioned them to the lowest bidder because the town had to pay the person who was taking them for the care. So uh, let's say you have Widow Trow and she needs to be taken care of. And they say, Who's, who will bid to take care of Widow Trow? And someone says, all right, I'll take care of her for $5 a month. And the town has to pay $5 a month. And then someone else says, you know, I, I can do it for four fifty dollars a month. They go, oh, that's better. OK, I will take the four. And they keep on going till they get to the lowest bid, because it's going to cost the town the least. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK. <laughs> yes, Bill. <laughs> I didn't know that Acton schoolmasters were chosen that way. <laughs> we'll do it for the least. <laughs> there you go. Mary, yes. uh, would you comment on the, the rationale, the why and the how, uh, the rationale that act, of Acton cleaving from Concord? Oh... Usually, I don't know the specific debates that may have come up, leaving, breaking off from one town and going to another could be a very simple matter or it could be a very ugly disputed matter. And I don't know the situation in Acton, but usually they leave because there's more development out in the newer area and it's too far to go on Sunday to the meeting house so that the distance to Concord Meeting House just got unmanageable and people petitioned and said we'd like to break off and form our own town. And then one of the requirements of the province was that they build a meeting house to satisfy that um, within a, I think it was a two years, I'm not sure, it's a, a brief period of time. And it was for the convenience of public worship. And may we have one last question? 
Let's, let's see if Matt, Matt, do you have any more from Zoomland? Yes, we have a couple of hands raised. I'm gonna call on them in the order that they went up. Okay, yes. <laughs> Fine, first one's from Lisa. Lisa, you should be able to speak. Um, I was wondering, what would the poor person who was carted out of town do? Yeah, <laughs> well, and sometimes it was whole families. More frequently, it was whole families. Um, so they would be put in a cart, taken out of town to the town border, left at the town border. And then they would try to make their way to any town where they felt they might be able to establish a claim of residency. Um, some of these people just ended up, it's really sad, but transients. Um, a month in one town, a month in the next. Sometimes they'd get someone to offer them work and they'd get permission to stay there for a little while, but they had no guarantees. And some of them ended up migrating to cities um, because there was more chance that they could hide undetected in the city and try to eke out a living. But it was a brutal way, if you were truly impoverished and you had no settlement, it was a brutal way to live. And again, that is that safety net that works so wonderfully if you belong. Hmm. Any other questions, Matt? You said there's another one out there? Yes, this one's from Frank and Sharon. They should be able to speak now. Uh, not a question, but uh, you initially asked, I think, about people who could trace history back in acting. Uh, and I just wanted you to know the great, great, great grandson of Stephen Shepard, who was an acting minute man, is watching your program okay, you and very close. much enjoyed it. Oh, and wonderful. Wonderful. And uh, he was an acting resident. Wonderful. That is great. Thank you for sharing that. The, the family story was that he was standing next to Isaac Davis when Isaac Davis was shot. Oh. Wow. Before we take the last question, when we're done with all of the students gather up here to take a picture. Okay. And the last question is right here. Um, did religion matter in belonging in a town? Well, Yes, um, and it's, that's a more complicated question than, than I can answer quickly, but for most of the colonial era, the town and the church were one. Um, you, the, town, the records would have been um, blended together. Uh, the church was not disestablished in Massachusetts until 1832. So up to that period of time, people paid taxes to the established church, whether they belonged to it or not. But um, religion certainly, um, being pious, being active in the church, being um, having owned the covenant, um, these were all positive um, aspects of belonging that would increase your reputation and your status within the community. Yeah. I just want to end by thanking all of you for being so patient with my nerdiness. I just <laughs> I really appreciate it. It was great. Thank you.